subscribe our channel and press bell icon to get the notification of new video. Like this video. Join our WhatsApp group to get daily latest updates. It's totally free. Part 1 You will hear a conversation between an event director and a student at a conference for studying abroad. First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 5. Hi there, how are you? I'm glad that you came to the convention today. We have a lot of schools here today talking about study abroad programs. You can talk to them and find out which program works best for you. We also have a presentation called How to Prepare for University Studies. I recommend that you attend. The presentation starts at 9am and it will help you understand what you need to do before you go to university. It will take place in the Blue Room. Oh, the Blue Room? Where is that? Ah, let me explain the schedule first. Then I'll tell you about where the events are. OK, thanks. Yes, so the conference organiser will talk about 30 minutes telling you how to prepare for university-level courses. They can be very tough for new students. He will also talk about the special needs of international students. They have a different set of issues to deal with than students from the home country. So you said that was in the Blue Room? Yes, that's right. And after that, you can go into the conference room at 10 o'clock. What is happening there? That's where the booths are. Booths? What kind of booths? One for each school, grouped into sections. People from each individual school will be able to give you information about different kinds of programs abroad. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 6 to 10. Now listen and answer questions 6 to 10. OK, so how do I get around the conference room? Right. Let me tell you about how to get there first. So when you exit the blue room, you have to turn left. Walk until you get to the end of the hallway and you'll see two doors on both sides of you. The conference room is on your right. The room on the left side is the banquet hall, but there aren't any events scheduled there for today. Oh, OK. The banquet hall is where the washrooms are. Yes, the washrooms are at the very back on the side opposite the doors. All right then, so how many schools will be represented? We have over 50 schools here today. Oh wow, that's a lot. That's okay. I'll give you a brief layout. The booths are laid out by region. That means schools from the same country will be in the same section. The first section you see when you enter the conference room are the schools from Australia. I see. That is quite a popular destination these days. What other sections are there? If you walk further on, the next section will have schools from Europe. Most of them are from England, but there are other countries as well. Oh, yes. Are there any places where I can get refreshments? Of course. Talking can work up an appetite. Refreshments are available all the way in the back of the conference room, past the Australian and European sections. Thanks for all the help. No problem. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part two. Part two. 
you will hear a recorded message giving tourists travel information in a large city. Thank you for calling the tourist line. There are many different ways of getting round the city and we'd like to suggest some you may not have thought of. How about a city trip by boat? There are four main stopping points. From west to east, stop A, Green Banks, stop B, City Bridge, stop C, Roman Landing, and stop D, Newtown. You can find the main booking office at stop A. The first boat leaves at 8 a.m. and the last one at 6.30 p.m. There are also many attractions you can visit along the river. At stop A, if you have time, you can visit the fine 16th century palace here, built for the king with its beautiful formal gardens. It's very near the booking office. Now you can enjoy every corner of this superb residence. Stop B. Why don't you visit Tower Restaurant with its wide range of refreshments? This is a place where you can sit and enjoy the wonderful views over the old commercial and banking centre of the city. Stop C is the area where, in the first century AD, invading soldiers crossed the river. This was much shallower than it is now. That's why this area is called Roman Landing. There's an interactive museum to visit here with a large shop which has a good range of local history books. At the furthest point of the trip, Stop D, the most exciting place to visit is the new editing place to visit is the new entertainment complex with seven screen cinema bowling alley, and video games arcade. Before you hear the rest of the message, you have some time to look at questions 19 and 20. Now listen and answer questions 19 and 20. Besides the boat tours, there are city buses. Two companies offer special services. The top bus company runs all its tours with a live commentary in English. Tours leave from 8.30 a.m. every 20 minutes. There are departures from Central Station, Castle Hill and Long Walk. This is a hop-on, hop-off service and tickets are valid for 24 hours. For further details, call Top Bus on 0208 944 7810. The number one sightseeing tour is available with a commentary in eight languages. Buses depart for part from Central Station every five to six minutes from about 9 a.m., with the last bus at around 7 p.m. There are also number one services with an English-speaking guide. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers.
Now turns to part three. Part three. You will hear a conversation between two students, Lynn and Robin, who are discussing an assignment. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 30. Now listen carefully to the conversation and answer questions 21 to 30. That essay we have to write, the one on how children learn through the media, how are you planning to write it? Well, I've given it some thought and I think that the best way to approach it is to divide the essay into two parts. First of all, we'd have to look at some examples of each type of media. Yes, what they are. Then we could describe how we can use each medium so that children can learn something from each one. Exactly. Maybe we could draw up a table and look at examples of each medium in turn. Hmm. Uh, let's see, um, the different forms of media would be the print media. You need of things like books and newspapers, that sort of thing. Hmm. And included in these are the pictorial forms of print media, like maps. Yes, maps are really just formal pictures, aren't they? Hmm. And then there are what we call the audio forms of media where children can listen. Mm -hmm. CDs and radios are probably the best examples because a lot of children have access to these, especially radios. And this would lead into the audio-visual media, mm. which can be seen as well as heard. Uh, film, television, uh, and we mustn't forget videos. Yes, but there's a final category as well. Computers mm -hmm. that make up the so-called electronic media. In the United Kingdom and Australia, they say that one in three families has a computer now. Yes, I believe it. Well, uh, that's a good list to start with. We're really getting some of this essay now. Hmm. So let's move on to when each type of medium could be used. Do you have some time to look at questions? I guess we could start by trying to identify the best situation for each type of media. What do you mean? I'm talking about whether each medium should be used with different size groups. For example, we could look at pictures and ask whether they're more useful for an individual child, a few children together, or a full class. In this case, I'd say pictures are best with individual children because they give them an opportunity to let their imaginations run wild. Yes, I see. Let's take tapes next. Although tapes look ideal for individual children, I feel they're best suited to small group work. Mm. This way, children don't feel isolated, because they can get help from their friends. Computers are the same. I think they're better with small numbers of children, and they're hardly ever useful with a whole class. Videos, however, are ideal for use with everyone present in the class, especially when children have individual activity sheets to help them focus their minds on what's in the video. And what about books? What would you recommend for them? Books are ideal for children to use by themselves. Mm. I know they're used with groups in schools, but I wouldn't recommend it. Other pictorial media, like maps, though, are different. I'd always plan group work around those. Mm. Give the children a chance to interact and to share ideas. Mm, I agree. Teachers often just leave maps on the wall for children to look at when they have some free time. But kids really enjoy using them for problem solving. Yes. Different people have different ideas, I suppose. Yeah, and different teachers recommend different tools for different age groups. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers.
Now turns to part four. Part four. You are going to hear a lecturer giving a talk about whale migration. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40. Now listen and answer questions 31 to 40. Today we're going to continue our investigation into the use of technology in plotting oceanographic migratory patterns. And I'd like to focus specifically on creatures that we didn't even realize existed until very recently. Pygmy blue whales. In particular, I'd like to talk about a high-tech method of tracking that researchers have used to find out more about these creatures. Pygmy blue whales, which are one of several subspecies of blue whales, spend their lives in the vast expanses of the Indian and Southern Pacific Oceans. They were first identified as a distinct subspecies in 1966. Before then, they were probably confused with the Antarctic or true blue whale, so it's only recently that researchers have started to learn about them and their migrations to and from their breeding and feeding grounds. Scientists are interested in pygmy blue whales because, although they are a very mobile subspecies, very little is known about their movements and their populations. Large-scale movements of whales are particularly hard to study, and what we do know about pygmy blue whales, we've mainly learned from examining whaling records. There are several populations of pygmy blue whales in the southern hemisphere, and two main feeding grounds off southern and western Australia. Scientists were interested in testing their hypothesis that the pygmy blue whales feeding off western Australia migrate to Indonesia to breed. To track the whale's movements, researchers made use of something called satellite telemetry. This refers to the use of a satellite-linked tag attached to a whale. When the antenna on the whale breaks the surface of the water, the tag communicates with the satellite system. The location of the whale can be determined when multiple satellites receive the tag's transmissions, much like how the navigation system works on a mobile phone. Researchers receive this location data in almost real time via the project website, which allows them to track the movement of the tagged whale from many miles away. The use of these tags has enabled researchers to discover that pygmy blue whales do indeed travel northwards from the west coast of Australia in March and April, reaching the warmer breeding grounds of Indonesia in June. They remain there until September, at which time they then return to Australian waters. In addition to identifying the migratory pattern of this particular population of pygmy whales, researchers also shone new light on the whales' feeding patterns. It's usually assumed that whales go without food outside of the summer when they leave their feeding grounds. But interestingly, the pygmy blue whales studied travel from productive feeding grounds off Western Australia to productive areas in Indonesia, and therefore probably still have the opportunity to feed whilst they're in their breeding grounds. It is hoped that mapping the migratory movements of the pygmy whales will help conservation efforts for these endangered animals. And the study has enabled researchers to identify specific conservation issues. For example, the migratory routes of pygmy blue whales correspond closely with shipping routes. Consequently, researchers are keen to monitor whether this has any negative effects on the whale's behaviour. Baleen whales, these are whales that use filters to feed, not teeth, use sounds to communicate and to gain information about their environment. Clearly, as pygmy blue whale movements correspond to shipping routes, there is potential for the noise generated by ships to affect communication and hence social encounters and feeding. 
Previously, researchers could only hypothesize that pygmy blue whales occupying Western Australian waters traveled into Indonesian waters. Now that this hypothesis has been borne out by evidence, conservation efforts can be undertaken in a wider area than just Australian waters. However, scientists aren't stopping here. A question mark still remains over the movements of the pygmy blue whales that utilize the feeding grounds further south, off the southern coast of Australia. Genetic evidence indicates that there is a mixing taking place between the population of whales in the feeding grounds of Western Australia and the population further south. Researchers are keen to discover whether the pygmy whales from the southern feeding grounds follow a similar migration route to those from the west coast, or whether they migrate to the subtropical region to the south of Australia. As a result, there are plans to tag the pygmy blue whales further south in order to find out whether they move through the same areas as the western population and are therefore exposed to the same risks. That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers.